WRFOP event on 104.5 FM broadcasting live from our undisclosed studio at the moment. Privilege and blessed. I'm going to give you the legal support disclaimer before I introduce the guest. WRFU is an open forum for the Banner Champaign community. Views expressed by those of the speakers and not intended to represent WRFU, UCMC, the Banner Social Forum, Air Shift is UPTV, UI Channel 7, or Virginia Tech University. <laughs> we'll just say that again. People try to go at me, man. You don't know what I do on the side. You know what I'm saying? Just give me. We have a distinguished guest and scholar at the moment. Can you tell them who you are, where you're coming from? I'm Nikki Giovanni. I don't know where I'm coming from. Neither do I, neither do I. But, but I came from my mama, to be quite frank. But I'm privileged and fortunate at the moment to have a, a living legend and a scholar, an American jewel, um, to be sharing the stage with me. Gonna have an intimate conversation, as I do with most of the scholars who come on here. I would say, if the earlier version, if it, you can even call it the PG version, um, <laughs> this is gonna be a little more uh, political and conscious in the sense that we're gonna go right straight at topics. A lot of folks wanna hear your opinion and have you opine on top topics that you may not have the venue to do so. So hopefully we'll, we'll delve into areas like that. But before we do, let's delve into a little bit of your background, how you got to this point. Um, first off, what exactly do you do? What do you, people may say, you know, people might hear your name and associate it with very different arts, but what, how do you describe what you do? I'm a writer. You're a writer. I, I write, and uh, predominantly I'm a poet, but I also do essays. I, I don't do plays, I don't do novels. Um, I've had, and, and, and fortunately so, some of my poems have, have gone into tone poems and, and some people have made songs out of them, all of which I find uh, very exciting. I like music, but I don't, I don't the only thing I play is, um, you know, now my, my little shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> I play the recorder, so maybe we can get together at some point. Uh, in terms of what you're working on now, are there any particular projects? I know you mentioned some of them during our conversation earlier, but that you can share with folks oh, who sure. may not have been privy to that. No, no I'm, I'm, I've got my producing hat on lately and uh, I've enjoyed it. Well, when I was 30 years old, which is now 38 years ago, I produced, I was the first woman and the first black woman, that goes probably without saying, to independently produce in Lincoln Center. And I produced my birthday party and, uh, at Avery Fisher Hall. It's 3,500 seats. And I don't know what you know about producing in New York, but uh, you only get one chance. I mean, if I didn't make that, not only would I be shut down, but uh, there probably wouldn't be another black producer in Lincoln Center forever. And so it was important to sell out. I mean, the, the not the bad way, not the bad way, the good way. No, the good way. The, <laughs> I, I, every ticket needs to be gone. And I remember Ticketron holds your tickets in New York, and so you can't have a major show at a major house without Ticketron. And Ticketron requires that you move 100 tickets a day at minimum. Mm -hmm. And if you're moving 99 tickets a day, they're going to shut you down because they're not going to keep it up. Mm -hmm. So you learn a lot about putting your producing hat on. I enjoyed Lincoln Center. It was good, and we did sell out, and I was thrilled about that. But I'm now at Virginia Tech, and I've been doing some other things. We, we produced the Lucille Clifton reading, and uh, I'd had some DVDs. That was so wonderful, 73 for 73. Lucille was 73 years old when she died. We got 73 poets to read Lucille, and we produced that with my friend Joanne Gavin up at uh, James Madison. She's our uh, sister institution. And, of course, my dream has always been, I've had uh, the privilege of having Toni Morrison visit uh, Virginia Tech, as has Maya Angelou. But uh, Tony lost her son recently, uh, Slade died, and we wanted to do something. I went down and talked to Maya because I enjoy producing this. There's a lot of minutia with it, but I, I love it. <laughs> and I talked to Maya, and then I went and talked to Tony. And so we're having, a, Maya Angelo and I are having a celebration with Joanne Gavin of um, Tony Morrison at Virginia Tech. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled about it because we always wait until these people are gone. And, and, and not that I won't be gone. I mean, you know, I'm no spring chicken here. But uh, when you I look, look at it, uh, well, <laughs> thank you. No, but I mean, when you look at it, I, I, don't, I don't want anybody to think that I'm thinking somebody's going to die because I'm not thinking somebody's going to die. I'm just thinking, why would we wait until somebody died before we say we love you? And, of course, uh, we had already started this. We started this over a year ago because just getting both of the, those ladies' calendars coordinated Took, uh, took a heck of a, <laughs> because they both stay so busy. But in the meantime, of course, we lost uh, uh, Whitney Houston, mm -hmm. which, which was really a shame. And, and again, a, as an old woman now, I'm thinking, what could we have done for that girl? What, 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 what could the old women have done to maybe, uh, we can't intervene, because it's gonna be too late. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not a drug counselor, and I don't know things like that. I'm, and I don't wanna be bothered with things. That's, that's not what I do. But you start to look at some of the young women around now. I am privileged to know some of them. I know uh, Queen Latifah, she's a, she's a, a, a great girl, and, and, and uh, I would consider her a friend. But you, you say, how do we reach out to these, these youngsters before they have a problem? 
somebody like Queen Latifah is not going to have a problem because she has such a head on her shoulder. Yeah, she's but, a soldier. But, you know, you start to look at some of the other young women out there. You look at Orion. I don't think there's anything I can do about that, and I don't want to. That's a world I don't. But, you know, if Chris Brown is going to beat you, you need to get away from him. Yeah. You don't need to, like, oh, he didn't mean it. Yes, he did. <laughs> a very problem. Did you hear the remix that they, she let go and that was very problematic from my vantage. What, did you have any opinion on that? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're not downloading the music or anything like that. But, no, I'm not. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm not, and I'm, I'm definitely not a Chris Brown fan. You know, but you know, a little bit of history. James Brown was screwing Tammy Terrell. And she didn't answer the phone when he called her one time. And James was a control freak. As, whatever you know about James, he's a control freak. And he went there and beat that girl to a fairly well. You know, she died. She ended up with a brain tumor. And it, it was really from James's beating. I mean, so why didn't that get learned? Why did Whitney have to be bothered with Bobby? I mean, just, I don't know. And, and maybe there's nothing we can do. It's just you. sometimes you start to look at these young women and you think, okay, you're going to be rich, you're good looking, and you're talented. So why don't you have good sense? Interesting. And in, in terms of the, I mean, you mentioned about, about earlier in the working years in terms of 30s. I recently heard a lecture, thanks to Brother A-Dub, by Ben Carson, where he remarked on the fact that it's really during your 20s and 30s when you lay the foundation for success and greatness. And, you know, can you, I guess, speak to what that was for you in terms of where you are at this point? I mean, you may not have seen it now. And it's like, <laughs> maybe you don't consider it, but, you know, the things that you were doing then and what sort of trajectory you were taking to help you to get to this point. Uh, you said that earlier, and I was thinking, uh, and what point would that be? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I just do my job, and I'm, I, I, I don't think I want to let anybody take that away from me. So I think I'm really happy. I, I didn't, when my, I was in my 20s, I did what came in my 20s. You know, you do what comes. I, I consulted uh, with, with Soul television show. I've always enjoyed things like that. I enjoy writing. Mm -hmm. I convinced Vogue magazine, that was one of my really good ones, I convinced Vogue magazine, which is fashion magazine, yeah. to send me, a black poet, to the World Food Conference in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> Got over real good with well, that. I did, because I was pretty sure they weren't going to publish it, but I was pitching it like, you know, your models have to eat, and they have to eat healthy food, and you're not sending anybody to cover it, and I'm offering to cover it. And, and normally in the business, it's a pay or play. Yeah. Uh, you have to learn that one really early. But I, I gave Vogue a really good deal. All you have to do is send me. And I'm going to send the article in, and if you don't run it, you won't owe me anything. Mm. So I thought that was pretty cool. You know, I mean, that, that was a good deal for Vogue. All they had to do was probably call a friend. I don't know how. I mean, I flew, but I don't know that they purchased the ticket or stuff. But, uh, you know, they're fashion people. That was fun to do. Yeah. But uh, I'm, a, I'm always looking for opportunities to write. I think I can write anything. And so I can't, but I think I can. <laughs> and <laughs> that allows me to accept a job that probably I won't be able to do, which is why pay or play becomes important for me. Hmm. And uh, I knew that a long time ago. That means that I turn the article in, you write my check. <laughs> I don't care what you do with it after that, it's yeah. yours. And if you don't do that, you'll have a lot of articles that don't get published and you get paid for either. And you have to eat. You're an artist, gotcha. but you have to eat and your rent has to be paid. And your Volkswagen needs gas. I don't drive a Volkswagen, but uh, I feel you on I that. Did. <laughs> I did. I know, I know what you drive. But you need, no, I mean, you, it's a business, so you never confuse the art with the business. You, you touched on food. Um, are you into organic food at all? Do you, oh, yeah, I'm a big fan. So let me ask you this. I gotta get into this maybe. I uh, actually frequent our local food co-op, um, the, uh, the co-op, the food co-op, <laughs> they're in uh, downtown Urbana and Lincoln Square. And one of the issues that I have is the cost of food. I don't know when you go to yours what the price range is, but it's always markedly different from the price of unhealthy food. Sure. You know, and it's, they call them, you know, food deserts. If you live in the hood or anywhere like that, you know, it's always cheaper. You can walk in there with a dollar and purchase something unhealthy with high fructose corn syrup versus walking into a food co-op. Walking out with something maybe like grains in a dollar, you know, there's nothing really like that. I guess if you could remark on your perception of the cost of food and, you know, uh, how we're subsidizing it. I mean, you know that. Uh, yeah. the corn syrup is, uh, that, that, it's subsidized. So we're paying for it, and we're paying for it twice because we, we subsidize the, the, the growing of it. And then the people eat it, and they're all obese, and they're having diabetes, and among other physical problems, and we're going to pay for it on that end. So I am not in favor of subsidizing farmers. I think that, that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big capitalist. You, but yeah. you, you may not have learned that one, but I am. I'm, I'm a big fan of capitalism, and it would be a good system if we had it. 
and then food. <laughs> it would, because then food would, would rise or fall to the level of demand. Hmm. And then good food would be able to compete with, with, uh, with, with, food, with, yeah. with uh, the drive-in foods. You yeah. know, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I, had no, I, I wouldn't be so hungry that I had to eat a McDonald's or some of that stuff. And, you know, I, I just, that's crazy because you're just going to kill you. But you're living, you, you said in the hood, but it, it, it doesn't matter. You're living in a restricted area. Yeah. You become prey to that. So we have subsidized food that you have paid for coming in at a cheaper price than you have not. Did that just make sense? No, definitely. And so that's, that's, that's unfair. I eat um, essentially organic, but I also eat local. Because yeah. there's something about knowing that. I live uh, in, in a, a college town, Blacksburg, Virginia. And so we, we are not always organic, but yeah. we're always local. So my chicken man is local. I know him. I know the chickens probably. If I, you know, if I wanted to get close to them, you know, is, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but my grandmother, you know, had the same thing. I don't know if she was organic, but we had chicken. We had a chicken coop, and so on Saturday she she'd go out and wring their neck. Now I'm not, you know. I'm not as good as my grandmother was about some things like that. Ms. Abrams, who lived across the street from us, had ducks. Mm -hmm. So I grew up eating duck eggs, you know, which are different. They're a little bit bigger, and it's a little more, uh, they're a little more gelatinous, I guess would be the term. But actually, the eggs that we eat, that we think of as being chicken eggs that you would get in, for example, and I'm not picking on, but Kroger's, are chickens that have just they, they've never moved around. Can't fly. You know, they can't do anything. And that's, so the egg is going to reflect that. And I have a colleague at school. I do butter for her, and she does eggs for me. And it's just a world of difference. The eggs just taste, you know, they, they just taste better. And again, I don't know, uh, if, if, I don't know if, it's, if it's organic, but I know that it's local. And of course, Eastern Europe, um, it, it's just incredible. Any beef that you want. And there is a, a, a real, uh, not beef, but pork. There's a real... Uh, question that I think is a legitimate question about how far around the world you want your food your food flown. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm going to agree with that that you're eating oil, but <laughs> Eastern Europe had no ability to buy uh, fertilizers, so they became a part of the organic movement inadvertently. And when the organic movement came in, Czechoslovakia, the proud, you know, all of those places, they never could afford. Right. So all of their their produce is so good. So if you want an incredible pig, you know the Karobi, you know, and things like that. But if you can get yourself a nice pig from Prague or someplace around in there, mm. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's all you know. It's it's just food, but you have to take care. You are what you eat. You you really are. And uh, I I do like farmed uh, fish though. I really do. Um, I think that we need to do more. I'm, I'm a water freak, and I think that we need to do much more with keeping the waters clean. Uh, you take a city, for example, like New Orleans and a city like Venice, which are, you know, two different parts of the world, mm -hmm. and yet these are international cities that have water problems. But if we look to the north, you've got Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and all of that, what the Dutch are doing. How come their cities aren't sinking? One of the reasons is that they're not destroying the barrier islands. They're keeping the clean, you know, the Dutch are incredibly clean people, and they haven't put a chemical plant that's d dumping crap into the Grand Canal. So when I first started going to Venice, there were fish swimming in there. You could actually fish hmm. and eat it. <laughs> and, you know, whatever's in the canal, now you don't yeah, want to fall in there. <laughs> you do not want to fall in there. You can come out with something from another planet. <laughs> and uh, I think that these are like world you, concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned that because I think that something to the effect of uh, $13 per square acre that we subsidize in terms of what we lose for farmers and then the cost we get with diabetes, the first number one negative outcome is going to come from those individuals is going to be uh, cardiovascular, myocardial infarctions is probably the primary, and then kidney issues would be second. Yeah. Very horrible in terms of the cost in terms of the U.S. health care system. Which in terms of person, and they yeah. go blind? Yeah, di diabetic retinopathy is yeah. uh, oh. atrocious. I mean, it's yeah. one of the worst things you can happen because you can't help the person at that point, that sort of situation. Um, we touched there. Let's talk about some of the interviews you've had. And I'm actually very curious, people may not know this, your interaction with, with James Baldwin. Uh, for, I would, I, I stumbled upon him as I was looking through some videos, uh, random scholars who were having random debates, and he always seemed to be the person to rise to the top in terms of being the cream of the crop. And I'm just curious to know what was like, what was it like in terms of your interaction with him, and what was your impression of him? Well, Jimmy's a wonderful man, first of all, and uh, I think anybody you talk to, you know, they all, Jimmy was my brother, you know, they all yeah. did that thing. I didn't ever think of Jimmy as my brother, but he was, <laughs> yeah, no, he's a wonderful man. And I actually was working with Soul, the TV show, Ellis Hazlett. 
-hmm. And I did Ellis a lot of favors because you, you can never go wrong. You learn that from a politician. You can never go wrong volunteering. Mm -hmm. And so I had been working with Soul. I had been helping him produce shows. And I learned a lot about producing, too. And Ellis finally said to me, you know, Nick, I owe you. And I'm yes, you do. <laughs> because he I'm did. Cash in on that. And I didn't, I didn't want a check because I didn't, it's not that I didn't need money, but it didn't. A check would have been the cheap way out. Yeah. And so he said, well, what should we do? And I said, well, I would like to talk to Angela Davis because she just got out of prison. I, said, yeah. I, I, I knew finally, but I didn't know Angela. Yeah. I said, I would love to, you know, take Angela Davis to Hawaii and mic her and we can walk on the beach and talk about what she'd been through. But, you know, I, I would just love to do that. And we couldn't get it done. Angela was busy. You know, she was involved uh, with other ideological things. And so we couldn't get it done. And we tried and we just couldn't get it done. I've, I've since met Angela. It's like, yo, girl, I want to interview you. And um, uh, he said, well, we're not going to get it. I mean, it was clear we couldn't get that done. Okay. And he said, well, is anybody else? And I said, James Baldwin. You know, and he said, well, I know Jimmy. <laughs> and I said, well, that's any time, any place. I will clear for James Baldwin, believe me. I, I would go to Moscow for James Baldwin. <laughs> and so he called Jimmy, and Jimmy was in, you know, he had his, his home in St. Paul de Vance, mm -hmm. which is on, in, in, on the French Riviera. And he called Jimmy, and Jimmy said, oh, I'd love to talk to Nikki, because I didn't realize he knew me, but there's a, uh, a video called um, uh, The Price of the Ticket. Mm -hmm. And you'll see his home has a uh, fireplace that's about eight feet tall. You know, Jimmy's one that tall, he's just yeah. my size. And so it's several feet taller than that. And he has books across it, had books across it. And one of the books was Spin a Soft Black Song. And so I was aware that he was aware, you know, it was one of those yeah. kind of things, but I didn't know him. And he said, oh, I'd love to talk to her, but I don't have time to come to the States. And so Ella said to me, Jimmy can't come to the States. I said, no, really, I meant it. I mean, I, North Pole, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and so we agreed to meet in London which was really wonderful. Well, I have, uh, I have a son. I had a son then, Thomas's little boy. And Thomas, of course, all the kids just gravitated toward Jimmy, whatever it was, you know, the kids. And so we would be up in the morning having breakfast because we stayed at, at Brown's Hotel if you, in London, if you know it, I'm right there it. by Princess Anne. <laughs> I'd like to know it. Oh, yeah, it's one of <laughs> Princess Margaret's quarters, okay. her, her park. And so Thomas and I would be up in the morning because, you know, you, you're dealing with Jimmy. It's like dealing with a jazz musician. Yeah. He's not going to wake up until the middle of the night. <laughs> so he'd be coming in, and we'd be having breakfast, and Thomas would go, Jimmy Baldwin, Jimmy Baldwin, take me for a walk. And Jimmy's like, you know, he's hungover. He's been out all night. He's, you know, it's like, I'll take you later. No, take me for a walk. And okay, and so he would take Thomas for a walk. And I thought anybody that would do that is a good man. Yeah. And we, we filmed in London, we did a two day filming, mm -hmm. and uh, it was aired and it became a book. And uh, just working with Jimmy, and I, I knew Jimmy all of his life. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he was a good man and, and, and a good writer and had a good heart and just everything you would want in a friend. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, I, I don't know anybody who knew Jimmy that didn't think that Jimmy had their back. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a, I mean, that's a compliment. If he said he would do it, he, he could count on him, and I think that that's a good thing. Yeah, he was a star, and, and I mean, he's amazing from all the videos. For those of you who don't know who James Baldwin is, oh, no. No, there's nobody that yeah, doesn't yeah, know yeah. who James is. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Going from uh, one star to another, let's talk about uh, the rift that transpired between Barack Obama and Professor Cornell West. Many people may not realize, I guess as a result of uh, Brother Cornell West's participation in his election and electoral process, uh, that ideologically there was a rift that transpired between the two afterward in terms of um, Professor West's view on his ability to, uh, Barack Obama's ability to support uh, the lower class socioeconomic status and also support black people in general. Um, and I guess there were some remarks made in particular in sort of a public setting between Barack uh, towards Cornell West, sort of demeaning him. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you were so any of those, it's just basically saying shame on you to Cornell West. And I was wondering what your, what your, if you had any thoughts on that rift and or whether your thoughts on Barack Obama in terms of his presidency. Well, I, I know Cornell, I don't know Barack. So <laughs> I, I think that a part of, uh, and I could be real wrong, was uh, Larry Summers. Hmm. Because I think that, uh, that guy. any, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, pres the former president of Harvard, and I think any dealings with, 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 with Summers would probably rub most thinking people wrong. And I thought it was disingenuous of the president to say that, you know, what well, he was really smart. I mean, I think his two worst appointments were Tim Geithner and uh, 
Larry Summers because they, they both were crooks and, and, and idiots and said demeaning things about women and of course Geithner is, is certainly the fox in the hen house. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, uh, it's like, oh, we have to hurry up and save Wall Street. Well, that's not why he was elected. I, uh, I think the president gets, you know, like a D uh, on, a, on this report card from me. And uh, I, I think that, that... He passed. He passed. No. <laughs> just barely. And uh, I'm, I, I have been concerned because uh, I keep hearing, oh, well, in the second term. But I, I don't live in the second term. There, there, there is no tomorrow. Right. The first president that I was very much aware of, uh, though I couldn't vote for him because there was no 18-year-old vote, was Jack Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And everybody was, in the second term, Kennedy's going to stop the war. And the second term, Kennedy is going to do this. And a thousand days later, he was dead. And so I have to always look at, at you, you have to do today's job uh, today. And I don't think that uh, the president has done a good job. Now, obviously, uh, if I were a betting woman, uh, my bet would be that he's going to be um, reelected. Uh, I think not nearly by the margin. Really? Oh no. I think it's going to be a slam. I mean, have you only if you get Rex Santorum or, or I mean, I think Mitt Lincoln. Romney. To be honest with you, Mitt Romney is just uh, he's such a corporate entity. I mean, and then he and Barack. And Barack is. I mean, they're actually politically they're very much similar in terms of a lot of the, the thin policies they've enacted. Although, and to Mitt Romney's defense, he actually passed universal health care for the state of Massachusetts because. My biggest Barack, problem with Barack Obama, well, one of them was the lack of universal health care, and the other was the deportation of scholars. During his presidency, we've actually had more people deported um, than we did during President Bush, which is, you know, in terms of timeline, it's just ridiculous. And he's hanging on to that string in hope with Sotomayor being elected to the uh, Supreme Court justice in terms of galvanizing Latinos to the polls. But it's just, I think that's going to be a, a crucial factor when he's trying to win the Latino vote in Florida and other states like in the South, the Southeast and Southwest. Um, that's just my opinion. So you, th you don't think you think it's going to be close? I think if it's Mitt Romney, it's going to be incredibly close, and for many of the reasons. Because if he comes to the black community and says he comes to the Latino community and says I, elect, I put the first black, uh, uh, first Latino woman on the Supreme Court, the black community is saying, and and what have you done for black people? There's no balance to a, 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 a truly stupid man, Clarence Thomas. Yeah. And uh, Clarence is stupid. Yeah. All you have to do is read his reviews. I, I didn't make that up, and that's not majority. Yeah. He's dumb. All you have to do is read his, 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 his opinions, yeah. and you realize you're reading a stupid mind. And so, what has he done? What has he done for black people? So he's gonna. It, it's a very careful line. I think that he's taking black people for granted, and I think that we're not to be taken for granted. So I don't. I mean, I don't. But I don't really care because I think 44 is like 43 and 42 and 41. And, and 40 and 39. I haven't seen anybody that's different. You have to go back to 16, and then you have to come up to 36, you know. You get, no, really, uh, Lincoln was different. Um, uh, Roosevelt was different. And the rest of them have all been corporate entities. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, in terms, in terms, so in terms of elections, to be frank, I think Mitt Romney's going to have a difficulty galvanizing his base uh, because of their problems with his religion. And then that, I think that's primarily that, and then there's also... See, I think that's wrong, and I think that's going to backfire. I think that's going to backfire. Yeah, you're talking about because he's a Mormon. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying that's what but I... That, I, that, I, that is that's what so un-American. That's what I view to be the rift between the Republican base and Mitt Romney. You look at some of the, the rhetoric that they slip into the little advertisements and no, comments they make about him, it's just... There's really no comment they can make about it, except maybe his position on pro-life, but he's willing to go with it whichever way the party wants him to go, to be quite frank. No, but we he's know that Mitt doesn't mean it, but nonetheless, <laughs> which I don't care, yeah. but that's not american because, again, now we go back to the 60s, you probably weren't in kindergarten if you were born. I wasn't but, even a glean of my uh, dad's at that point. And, and we had Jack Kennedy, who was a, a Catholic, yeah. and everybody was like, oh, Boston. we can't have a Catholic as mm -hmm. president. Well, Jack got elected. He didn't live, but he got, um, yeah. he got elected because it's just something un-American about saying, if you are not some sort of born-again, snake-handling Christian, mm -hmm. you can't be president. That is ridiculous, and I yeah. think that's going to backfire. If the Democrats pull that, it's going to backfire in the worst way. Yeah. So we have now in the local, local community a couple issues which I wanted you to point on. One is that we're in the process of building or the considering the building of a new prison. They're considering spending $20, $20 million to revamp the uh, county prison, and a lot of people are um, adamantly against it for the reason that there's always a a willfulness to incarcerate rather than to educate. And they want to build new facilities without having a primary focus of 
um, sort of rebuilding folks to be able to contribute back to the community. Just sort of just to be able to keep a more watchful eye so they don't hang themselves, I guess is the, the notion behind this. Um, what is your opinion, I guess, on the prison industrial complex and I guess the way it's siphoning funds and resources away from education, particularly communities of color? Well, first of all, I, I think prison is an idea whose time has passed. Mm. And uh, I don't, I really am being hard pressed on what somebody should do that they should be in prison. Mm. I'm a, a fan of jails because jails are local and you do something and your parents or your mother or somebody has to come and bring you food or you don't eat, you know, this is Mayberry, that's a jail, right? You get drunk, it's a jail. You smoke a little marijuana, it's jail. But these prison complexes, I have a friend who's up in Florence, Colorado, and of course H. Rod Brown is incarcerated in Florence, Colorado, which is a maximum security prison, guaranteed to make you crazier than whatever it is that sent you there. It's a bad idea. It, 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 it was supposed to be more humane than some of the crap they used to pull in, in the 18th century, the 17th century. But the idea of, of putting, of warehousing people is absolutely and positively repugnant to me. And the fact that we're here in the 21st century still discussing putting people in prison shows a lack of imagination and a lack of commitment. We do know we can put a collar on you and find out where you are, should we need to keep up with you for however long it is. We can also involuntary, since they're so happy to stick something up my vagina, we can also... <laughs> 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 That's all they've been talking about lately. So we, we can lay... They, wanna, they don't want to pay for it. <laughs> but we can lay you down and we can put a chip in your back and sew it back up and let it heal. We keep you, you'll never get it out. And we can find out where you are. We don't need to put you in prison. Because prison, we know, does not help anybody. There's no education going on there. All we have, that, that guy who, the lipstick killer here in Chicago, just died because he was 80-something years old. We kept that man in prison for all, I mean, what, what, 60 years we had to pay for him? And either execute him, you know, for whatever that is, or find another way to find out where he is that he's going. I mean, he finally said things like, you know, well, I'm, I'm too old to hurt anybody. Well, we can't let you go for what you did. You know, you, 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 you murdered and dismembered some six-year-old child. We don't want to live with you. Or as one of the parole people said, well, God may forgive you, but the state of Illinois isn't. Mm. And I thought, well, good, because no, nobody, I'm, not, I'm not Jesus. You know, let him go in and wash your sins away. That's, that's not what I do. Mm. You're going to do something like that, we're going to deal with it. But I think that the President of the United States does not have many duties domestically, but one of them is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And obviously, if I can have my life, if I don't have my life, he can't do anything, right? So the first thing that I think that, that needs to be a federal crime is murder. It's, that shouldn't be local because there's too much prejudice involved. Hmm. It should be, a, a, it's something that actually, and now that we finally got rid of Hoover, thank God he's dead, it's something <laughs> that the FBI, in terms of investigating crimes, because crimes are emotional. And if you keep asking the people who are part of it to investigate it, they're going to look for what they, they want, right? Mm -hmm. So in the South, there's going to always be the black guy. Mm -hmm. No matter what it is, no matter where it happened, it's always going to be, no, show, round up the usual suspects. Right. And so I think, that, the the, I think <laughs> that this is a, a, a truly an, a, a federal situation that we need federal concerns because now people move across state lines, maybe in the old days, Maybe in the 17th centuries, with countries coming up, you know, you had other problems. You could escape to the west or you could escape to the north, but you can't now. I mean, the country is a unified country. You can get on a car and you'll be in California in two days. So we obviously need a federal situation where we can find out who's moving where and what they're doing. Did I just make sense? No, no, I'm not no. trying to be persuasive. I'm just saying I think that it's a, uh, and I think of education, by the way, in the same way. Education is not a local concern, it's a federal concern. Definitely. Because an, uh, an ignorant populace will lead to demagoguery. And we are at that point that, that the Republicans are actually running a campaign based on sexual activities of women. Because they're not dealing with men. They'll say, oh, the men will put a, a, a condom on. My reproduction, <laughs> that's what they said. I know, I'm just saying. And, 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 and my re reproduction rights should not be residing in whether or not the man that I'm with has chosen to use a condom that he didn't stick a little hole in because he thought, wouldn't it be fun if she had my baby? Because the men don't fight about abortion, they fight about whose child they want aborted. They want you to have their children, they want you to abort your boyfriends. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. They want their daughters, right? They want their wives to have the children, but they don't want their daughters. I remember when Billy Graham, the hypocrite that he is, everybody loves Billy Graham. I remember Billy Graham's daughter had an abortion, she went to Sweden. 
And everybody said, because he's Billy Graham and she's rich. Billy, and so Billy why does he do that? He said, well, she's too young to have a child. Well, who the hell isn't Billy? <laughs> So why does your 16-year-old daughter get to go and have an abortion? That's when they were legal here in Sweden. But my 16-year-old girl has to go on welfare and drop out of high school. Same sex. So I'm tired of, I'm, I'm tired of the Republicans. I'm, I'm tired of, of the whole, I'm, I have a right to my body. I, I, I interpret the 15th Amendment. I can't be the only person. I know I'm smart, but I'm not that <laughs> smart. That looks at the, the right to, to not be uh, uh, the, 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 I have a right to not be, uh, what do you call it, uh, involuntary servitude mm -hmm. unless convicted of a crime. I have a right to my body, in other words. But then biblically, and I go so sick of them doing that, Jesus said, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. I'm sure he was talking about abortion. You know, he always was. I'm sure he was. You know, it's just Jesus. You know, he always couches He's a poet thinker. He's, He's a, a poet, thinker. you know. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Say, so, Jesus, I'm pregnant. Well, if I write out, offend thee, pluck it out. You know, and it's like, oh, okay. Because you get sick of that. And, and none of them are women. So they need to buck the hell out. Yeah. And one of the, you touched on education. Um, for me, one of the biggest issues with education is how it's funded. And I take umbrage with the fact that it relies on local funding. That's what I'm saying. It should so, be local. Yeah, and it really relies on they're sort of winning the embryological lottery in terms of having access to a quality education. Because you can have students who are stellar, you know, taking advantage of all the resources within their community, 4.0, and never have access to an AP course mm -hmm. by virtue of the county into which they were born. Right? And so there's no equity in, across the country. And I think that's a federal issue, that if we had enough scholars who were able to take it to the courts to fight that, we'd find that there's an intrinsically... Um, there's an inherent bias, and particularly against communities of color. You know, we have a lot of sundown towns and communities that have excluded us from being able to live in those areas. And by, historically, by virtue of that, we have not access to that educational system. But they would rather be ignorant. I mean, I, I'm in, in Southwest Virginia. We have people that would rather their children be taught that God stepped out on space and looked around and said, I'm lonely, I'll make me a world. And in seven days he did that, and it's flat. They would rather that than that their children go to school under uh, one, a, an integrated, not just desegregated, but an integrated situation where we were teaching good science. Do you know, I mean, the Republicans, and I'm, I'm not a Republican, because I think they're stupid. You sure, I'm gonna <laughs> I was going to ask you, that was my next no, question. <laughs> yeah. You know, you look at, and, and it, it, it's insane that they're fighting global warming. Common, yeah. <laughs> common sense, this is common sense, you have to go beyond that, you're a science person. Common sense says Earth has been warming up since the Ice Age. Yeah. <laughs> Absent that warming, we would still be in the Ice Age, yeah. right? And that there's an ebb and flow to life on this planet because the planet is a living planet. So you don't have to, you don't have to dig into your Old Testament, your New Testament, Revelation, <laughs> what Satan is going to be up to, none of that shit. What you have to deal with is that Earth is warming up and eventually it will be inhospitable to human beings. It will not hurt Earth to be inhospitable human beings. It will only hurt human beings. But given what we have done with a pretty good system, we deserve to be annihilated. As the dinosaurs are gone, as every day we're losing a couple of hundred species here or there, we'll be gone. We're just upset because it's us. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no we, 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 we're not good stewards, but even if we had been better stewards, we're going to lose it because at some point everything dies. And in that dying, we could also properly call it a transition. That energy is transitioned, and something else comes, and that's going to happen here. But that's not, that's not from an ignorant point of view. That's from a reality point of view. That's, that's good science. And one of the things that I hope that we do, which we won't, and I'm not going to the United States, but Earth, is that we need to also seek out new life forms. Because this one's going to change. Not I think it's probably predictable. It's another couple of thousand years that we're good for. But uh, it's going to change. As we, we, we can look into the heavens and you, you see it. We know that there's, there's what, what is now called dark energy. I always love it when they use those terms. <laughs> because they dark energy on Earth. You know, the first Earth. energy in America was dark. It was black people. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. But obviously, we look, we see black holes. We see energies that we're not sure of. We've been having sunspots lately. All of these things uh, are going to impact, and I think it's wonderful. I just wish we had better science so that we became better stewards of this life for as long as we have it. 
I'm definitely a big fan of science, obviously. I want to praise you for a bit and give people some background as to how we f I first came to, uh, to know about you and to actually meet you. I think it was back in 99, 98, you actually came to Wellesley College. Uh, the ladies of Ethos, big shout out to them at the time, I uh, brought you there to speak. And I was, you know, I, I didn't know who you were. It's like just some black girls invited me. They all look good. So I was like, let's, let's, let's go. <laughs> they, Deltas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they invited me over there. And I saw, I went over there and I heard you speak. And you remarked, and you were going through some st stuff at the time. And you had dyed your hair and you had gotten your tattoo. <laughs> and for those of you that don't know, she has a tattoo that says Thug Life on her left arm. And she was telling a story about how, in, to sort of summarize, that you wanted to imbue what Tupac represented because you felt that if he was what was hated, and you, you viewed him as being beautiful and all the things he was producing, then you wanted to have that prominently placed on your arm as a reminder to others so that they could direct that hate toward you to sort of, I guess, siphon and ease the pain in the world and maybe that help deal with the issue. And you also dyed your hair. So me, and so the tattoo and the dye in your hair, me being the impressionable mind, nah, 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 you didn't think <laughs> <laughs> But I did dye my hair. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I took that as a remark because I said, you know, I, I thought about your words pretty heavily. And that was the first time I came across you. And I think every time you speak, your beauty is rebirthed into someone else's mind to be remade and reenacted in some you. other way. And so I'm going to thank you for the opportunity to interview. But uh, do you have any thoughts or words for the folks out there who, who might be interested in you? Actually, before we, before we do that, let's take some questions. Do people in the audience have questions? Does anyone have? Oh, there's a, <laughs> you okay with having a call? Sure. Let's say we'll take Four questions and that's it, okay? And I'll good. be brief, because the, the questions are always brief. It's, it's me that goes on. Oh, no, it's okay. So let's go to someone in the back. Uh, let's go from the other way. The people I can't see who are all the way in the backdrop. Is that, I can't, is that Otis or someone in there? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Go ahead and say the question. I'll repeat it afterward and then I'll ask you to answer. Definitely. Black or African American? The, the question is black or African American? Black. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Capital B, I'm assuming. <laughs> uh, no, you know, Gwen Brooks, uh, responded well to that question also. Uh, I think of Elijah Wan, I'm going to show my age again, but you remember the basketball player? Elijah Wan. Okay, Elijah Wan. Yeah, he's an African American because he's African, he came to America, he's a citizen, that's fine. I've been here, I'm just a black American. And Americans don't like it when you say that because that makes them white. <laughs> and they don't want to be white, they want to be Americans and everybody else has to be something else. But I'm black. Say it loud. <laughs> All right, uh, let's get the lady over there behind Mike, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll get uh, April and then Gianni after that, because I can't see any other hands. Okay. Uh, as a writer of poetry, um, did you ever find out yourself at a time where you could not write? The, the question was, as a writer of poetry, did you ever find a time where you had a uh, mental block where you were unable to write? I, don't, I wouldn't know because I don't try to write all the time. And uh, we were laughing before the show began. I, I think the only thing I do every day, I was trying, I, I said there was nothing I do every day. And then I realized, yes, the one thing I do every day is read. I, I read something. A, a, a day without reading something is totally, I don't know when I've done that. But in terms of writing, you don't have something to say every day. So why would you put that burden on yourself? And the last writer that I was aware of, that would, or not the last, but close to it, because Ann Sexton had that kind of, I need to write, you know, and I really love Sexton's work. I think she's a wonderful poet, you know, and she killed herself. You know, you get sick of that. Sylvia Plath killed herself. But Hemingway, you know, used to try to write every day. He'd stand up, you know, he wrote standing up, but it's like when he, I want to write every day. He killed himself, and I thought, hmm, if I don't want to kill myself, one of the things I should do is not write every day. So <laughs> I don't do that, and I don't even try it, because every day you don't have anything to say. Well, why would you have something to say? Nobody has anything to say every day. People you love, you don't want to talk to every day. <laughs> Tell me about it. Okay, uh, let's get April, and then Joni will have the last question. Two questions. One, what's your favorite color? What is your favorite color? Oh, actually blue, as you, you may or may not, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, and then what is your happy spot? I'm sorry? What is your happy spot? <laughs> what are you offering spot? me? The question is, the question is, for those of you out there who came here, says, what is your happy spot? Oh, well, I think I'll decline on that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gioni, do you have a question? Happy place. Happy, your happy place. Where do, where, do you, where do you go to be happy? Oh, home. Home. I, I like home. And uh, right now my dog is in the, um, she, she goes to the spa. And so Alex is in the spa. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's a nice dog. She really is. Uh, uh -huh. Yorkies are such divas. She's a Yorkie. They're they such divas. <laughs> but uh, I'll, be, I'll be going home. I go home. 
and uh, I got Alex, and uh, it's been it's, it's beginning to be spring, and I have a fish pond, and we go out to the fish pond, and I uh, usually I drink a kind of cheap champagne, and I usually just take a glass, and I go out to the fish pond. It's it's just feel like you know God is what did Robert Brown <laughs> say? God is in His heaven, and all is right with the world. Gioni, with the last question. Any words of wisdom for our young black feminist, um, particularly in this time with uh, racism and sexism politically? Any words of advice for a young black feminist? Uh, she said wisdom. 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 Sorry. But thank you for her. Any words of wisdom uh, for young black feminists in this time of sexism and racism? Uh, well, or womanist. Yeah. Woman. A womanist. But that's <laughs> Alice's term, and Alice is quite brilliant. I'm, I'm really not an ideologue, and I think that that's probably one of the things that if somebody had said, what one thing do people not understand about you? And uh, the, probably the answer would be that I, I, I don't have ideologies. Like I don't have a lifestyle, mm -hmm. I have a life, and <laughs> I have values. And so you said, whether it's feminist or womanist, you, you, you have to be really careful that you don't get into a cult situation so that you think it has to fit here, and when it doesn't fit, you can't use it. Uh, help comes from all sides. I'm, I'm, I'm a mountaineer by, by birth. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, which is in the hills of Appalachia. And of course, we grew up, I shall lift up mine eyes until the hills from hence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, for whatever the Lord means to any of us. But you can't have that even as a philosophy. You have to have values. And the values that you have will fit in or out. But you may find yourself, you work with some of the racists, some of the sexists. You work with some of the people that don't like you because you're not there to like them. That's why you have a home and a lover and a dog. Right. You work with people because you have to get things done. You, you, and you have your people that are close to your heart. There's a big difference. And I think a lot of times we, 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 we in the liberal community, and I would consider myself a part, clearly I'm more liberal than conservative and I'm certainly not a moderate, but we're always trying to get people to agree with us. It doesn't matter what they agree with. What matters is what do we get done today? You know, I'm, I'm not, uh, in, in Vietnam during the war, it, you know, there was an old expression which I always loved. If you have them by the balls, their hearts and minds will follow. <laughs> and <laughs> I always like that. And I think the same thing, you know, you, you, you approach it as I am committed to this theory. And what and I don't I would have no advice. I I I'm so leery of theories and people telling you that you are adhering to this theory or you are not adhering to this theory. When you're looking at it should be or probably your life. And what you're trying to do is get something done, a kid fed, a book to somebody, some old lady or some old man who needs a ride to the drugstore. I mean, you're just trying to get done something, which may or not fit somebody's idea of who you are or what people who think like you think do. So I don't, I don't have ideologies. I just have the values that I try to live by. Ray, can we do one more? One more question. You okay with one more question? Sure. Go one more question. Last question. Uh, who is your favorite poet and why? Who is your favorite poet? Oh, and that why? is uh, way too too hard uh, <laughs> because I, I absolutely and never did meet him, uh, Langston Hughes. I adore mm -hmm. Langston, but of course I had the privilege of, of being a friend to Gwen Brooks. We share a birthday, and I used to come to Chicago. Gwen was a big uh, gossip, as some of you know, and no, Gwen call you six o'clock in the morning, you know, because she she and Margaret Walker both were gossips. And I, I so enjoyed my friendships with them, but I love their work. So it's, you know, that's, that's just not one of the questions that, uh, that you can ask. I love Toni Morrison's, first, the, the quartets, if you look at Toni's work in, in, in terms of the, the quartets, you've got, you know, from The Bluest Eyes, Sula, Song of Solomon, Tar Baby, and then you have uh, Beloved, Jazz, uh, Paradise, and um, Love. And now she's starting this, this next thing. And she has a book coming out. So, uh, you know, and Mercy is out. I mean, you know, so you love writers. And, and uh, most of my reading, actually, uh, Tony would be the extent, pretty much, of my fiction reading. Most of my reading is in nonfiction. But uh, I like writers, and I like what we do. And you try not to be influenced by unpleasant writers. Some, some writers are really quite brilliant, but incredibly unpleasant. You don't want to spend any time with them. 
And I know a lot of people that got mad at Miles because Miles, you know, had a bad habit of putting his hands on his girlfriends. But I was never Miles's girlfriend, so it was always Mr. Mr. Davis, and he was always very nice to me. And I knew a lot of the old jazz guys, you know, so you try not to let that interfere with the music, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I, it didn't mean that I thought Miles should beat his girlfriends. I really didn't, but I knew that that meant I shouldn't be one. <laughs> that I did know. So, you know, you're trying to, again, you're, you're negotiating this space between what do I have a right to ask and what am I trying to give and how much space will I let people come into my space because I am protective of uh, what James Baldwin called the floor upon which I dance. And, and uh, I don't believe that anybody has secrets, by the way, but I think that everybody's entitled to privacy. So you have to protect the people that you love. Thank you. Do you have any words or, of advice uh, or words of wisdom, I guess I should be corrected, for any young scholar who's coming up who would like to pursue a career as you have in terms of being prolific as an educator and a writer, um, just words of wisdom you know, that you want to offer them? No, I don't, because if they're going to do what I did, they don't need me to tell them that. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, it's a waste of one of our time. And <laughs> good luck. I mean, life is fun. You just keep trying to do it. You know, you just keep enjoying it. And you're going to make mistakes. I mean, a, a life that, that is, is, is mistakeless is, is, is lack of imagination. And you, you're going to wish that you had done something better. You're going to look at a poem. You're going to think, oh, I wonder if I could have... Crafted more. <laughs> yeah, you know, just something. But then, you know, you can overwork anything. And, and uh, I come from a family. My grandmother was a great baker. I live with my grandmother. And I'm a good meat cooker. But grandmother was a great baker. And you know, for those of you who bake, whatever you're doing with dough, if you overwork the dough, it's going to fall. And I feel the same way about poems. You have to, at some point, just let it go, put it in the oven. If it souffles, you got it. If it doesn't, throw it away and start it again. <laughs> and so that's... That's not advice or anything, it's just uh, I can throw away food and I can throw away poems. You know, I, I can do that and I've had friends because some, I, I cannot cook when I'm writing. Mm. And I'm a good cook, I really am. <laughs> and my son used to always say, you know, he'd come home and something would be burning or something was just really messed up. And he'd say, oh, writing again, are we? <laughs> I guess he could always tell, you know. Yeah. And uh, I can't, I mean, even uh, the other day I, I had some little lamb sickles. And I threw them in the oven. I was doing something else and didn't think about it until I smelled them burning. Mm. And then I thought, well, what the hell, eat them anyway, because I was in a hurry. So I did. And it was really good olive oil on them, but um, <laughs> they were just burning up some potatoes in there. <laughs> you know, but uh, you, you just, you have to learn to let things go. And you have to learn when you've done your best that that's the best that you can do. I'm a big fan of that. I say that to women all the time, because I don't think you have to say that to men. Men get, you know, very proud of, oh, the sun is shining today. You didn't have a damn thing to do with it. You know, like, yeah, the sun is shining. <laughs> and the women are sitting around, oh, it's raining, honey, I'm so sorry. I didn't, you know, and it's like, no, you have to know, to use a cliche, when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, <laughs> and know when to run. <laughs> Well, I want to thank Nikki Giovanni for coming on the show and for blessing me, giving me the privilege of interviewing her. It's been definitely uh, one of the best interviews, I think, and one of the best opportunities I've had thus far with the show. We keep bouncing around from different avenues in different ways, and people may not realize. It's, it's, it may seem well crafted from the backdrop when you look at the videos, but we just keep falling into very fortunate situations, and I'm blessed. And I want to thank you for coming on, you. Living Legend on here. Again, it's WRFU, Pierre Banner, 104.5 FM. We're filming in front of a live audience. And if you want to give us feedback or be here in the audience, you can email, email me at WRFU at the show 1045.com. WRFU at the show 1045.com. I want to thank Tom, who's in the backdrop. I want to thank Mike. I want to thank all the folks in the audience. I'm going to sign off here. Thank you all to the live studio audience. Thank you. Thank you.